here is chemical. Well, I sat in those chairs 20 years ago. Campus looked much different. But uh, it's good to be back here and it's good to have the opportunity to present at my <coughs> school. So. Okay. So if you guys have co questions throughout this, feel free to stop and ask any questions you have. I get really excited about this stuff. So. guys covered so far this year in the combustion course? So, I can go down the list. No. Sure, <laughs> read the syllabus. <laughs> so, we did basic combustion chemistry, fluid flow, CFD, general pollution, post-combustion treatment, NOx, advanced diagnostics. We had uh, Zoe and people come and talk about their stuff. Oh, the laser stuff? Yeah. Uh, flare radiation, heat transfer, process heaters, process burners, and burner testing. Cool. So, you should get all of what I'm about to say. That's pretty much, uh, that's a healthy dose of fundamentals. What do you think about combustion so far? Interesting, boring? That's interesting. Best class. Oh, great. That's because it's Chuck, right? <laughs> no. It's, uh, combustion's interesting because, you know, you, you think, and I assumed you guys covered this in the, maybe the beginning on the mechanics of combustion, it's a lot more advanced than people think when you simplify the equations just from methane oxygen and then what comes out the back but all the subspecies that exist and all the it's, it's very very fascinating I mean, there's a lot of stuff that you have empirical data but you don't really have all the the math yet we're good yep. all right so hello everybody my name is scott pollard i'm with john zinc i've been there for seven years prior to that I uh, did the install side of it. So I am the end user team lead project manager. And that basically means I'm in charge of retrofit projects for the company. So uh, I get to see all sorts of fun applications where it's existing technology when we're trying to upgrade it. So a lot of times uh, customers have new process requirements or new missions requirements and that's kind of the, the area that I fill. So we're gonna talk about boiler burners today. Um, we're going to first start with boilers, then go into burner fundamentals and burner design strategies. And based on our conversations, I think some of this you may have already done, but we're going to go through it and see how it applies to the boiler burner world. Okay. So what are boilers used for? Boiling, Boiling things? What do boilers do? Boilers make steam, okay? Fundamentally, a boiler is designed to make steam. We're taking water, we're elevating it, we're turning it into steam. What do we do with the steam? Run a, turbine. Run a turbine, that's a great example. So boilers are used for heating, they're used for industrial processes, they're used for turbines, for power. Um, turbine, uh, steam has all sorts of uses from, you know, let's say canning operations to make our food last and make more shelf stable to providing heat for this campus there you know over the physical plant I think there's four or five big boilers that generate the medium temperature hot water for the whole campus um, power generation you guys already mentioned that so some boiler history you know before boilers existed 
there was a lot of manual work done, right? People had to live near rivers so you could have big paddle wheels to run equipment in buildings. You had to have manual saws or you had animals that would you know, run on circles to kind of do a lot of work. And then boilers came along and boilers changed all that because now I can use a boiler to make steam to drive a process, whether it's to run a sawmill or to do mining or to process food or trains, right? Trains join the whole country and that was all made possible by <coughs> boilers or transocean travel on ships. It became a lot easier when boilers were around because you didn't have to worry about the trade winds or people rowing. So boilers really have a big impact. It's one of those, if you put it on a, on a boat or on a train, it's considered a prime mover. It's a, it's a big technology. It was really revolutionary. Shipboard boilers, you know, in the early days, they used it for propulsion. Now they still have steam on aircraft carriers because you have to run the little plane launcher, you still have hot water, you still have all those needs. They may just be generated differently. You know, used to it was maybe diesel fuel, now it's nuclear power that generates the heat to generate the, um, uh, the energy for the boiler. So here's some examples of some commercial scale boilers. This might be what they have over at Kepling, or, or not Kepling, or home. sorry, the physical plant. If you ever get the opportunity to go over there and tour it, it's a really nice facility. Um, they're typically rated in boiler horsepower versus more industrial boilers or pounds per hour. So if somebody's talking about a, a boiler in terms of horsepower, you can pretty much assume it's a commercial application. And if they say pounds per hour, it's industrial. They mostly generate saturated steam. You know what the difference between saturated and superheater steam is? Yes, lots of head shaking, okay. Um, and they can be fired on typically gas or liquid fuels. For industrial boilers, they're larger. Um, they can fire a variety of things. They can still fire gas fuels, liquid fuels. Some of them get into more exotic stuff, uh, plant gases, uh, refinery gases, off streams from processes. Uh, they can be used as incinerators where you're just taking a waste stream from, uh, say, a cracker and running it through there, any sort of hydrocarbon that you can burn but they can generate both uh, saturated steam and superheated steam. Then there's the utility scale boilers. So that's power plants, right, running gas turbines. And these can be very large. Um, when you're generating gigawatts of power, they have to be very large. You can see from a size comparison, you know, person standing next to it, not very big. Then we get larger and that's on a low boy. And that's probably, you can see the crane in the background, that's probably, I don't know, probably 20 or 30 feet high. And then something like this that is probably 10 to 14 stories tall. So they all have different applications. These are my favorite. <laughs> so. so typically there's, there's two types of boilers. There's a package boiler and a field erected. So the package boiler, like the first two that we saw, you know, the small ones, you can get it and you can basically put it on a truck or put it on a train and ship it to a site. So they pretty much pre-assemble everything and off it goes. Field erected are like the utility boilers. You can't, you can't put that thing on a truck and go down the road. Um, and there, there are still pieces that may be erected on site. You had talked about, uh, I believe you said post-combustion SCR type stuff, yeah. and it's gonna be on the back end, right? So they'll erect a stack in those things when it gets to the site. So this is an example of a packaged water tube boiler, and this is an O-type, and engineers are fantastic at naming things, right? So we call it an <laughs> O-type because there's a steam drum on top, a mud drum on the bottom, which you can't see under here, and the fire goes down the middle, it looks like an O. Okay. D type, because it looks like a D, right? We're <coughs> super creative. So what we're seeing in this picture, this is interesting. This is um, the D section or the, the radiant section. So the fire would be coming in through here 
and then it would be making a turn at the back of the boiler and coming back through the convective section. So this would be the radiant section and that's the convective section. This is another type of boiler. This is called an OTSG or once through steam generator. So in this type of application, they just take water, they run it through the boiler, they heat it up, they make steam, but then they dump the steam. So typically with boilers, you're not dumping steam. You're using it for an application or you're recovering the condensate and bringing it back because in these types of boilers, water quality is very important because you're applying a lot of heat to the water and if there are minerals and things in the water, they will come out of solution and they'll actually plate out on the tubes on the inside and then you have all sorts of problems. But on an OTSG, they're actually designed for that. One pass through and then it's gone. This is primarily used like in tar sands and in oil extraction where they're trying to put it down a hole to extract um, oil and natural gas. These have a lot shorter life expectancy than the other ones. Field erected. So field erected are the big ones. Those are like your utility boilers. Um, this is a wall fired unit and has in this case six burners that fire into the radiant section. So it's the same concept as even a package boiler. Here's our radiant section. It goes through convective section on the back side. So the, the whole goal is to get as much heat out of your process as you can, right? Uh, this is a field erected front wall fired utility boiler. Um, this one, I can't remember how many megawatts this, this boiler, there's two turbines on the back end, but they were generating a considerable amount of power. This is in New York and it was powering many city blocks worth of businesses and homes. These are kind of the internals of a field erected boiler. This one is for a coal application. So fire is down here in the convective section, excuse me, the radiant section. You have convective section tubes up here. So in your radiant section, you're typically just gonna have, it looks just like steel tubes. In your convective sections, you're gonna have finned tubes because there's no radiant energy coming off the fire in that space. You're taking the heat that's in the air and pulling it out. So the tube banks look different from where you are in the boiler. But you're coming in, you've got air, you've got in this case coal, you're burning the coal in this section, you have overfire airports. Did you learn about that in your NOx control stuff? About what overfire airports were? No? Okay. So sometimes you, you have to have the right amount of oxygen to combust, right? But in order to try to do temperature control on your flame, sometimes you'll delay combustion. So you have a certain area where it's combusting and then you'll add air later on to finish the burnout, but you can get lower NOx out of that because your flame's overall cooler. So that's how they try to do that in big field erect units. You go up to the top, more tubes, economizer again to get more heat out. On a coal plant, you're gonna have electrostatic precipitators to try to get any ash and mercury and things you don't wanna go up the stack. An air preheater, because again, we're trying to get as much efficiency out of this as we can. So we're gonna heat the combustion air that goes back through the process, some more precipitators and out the stack. So if you see a field erected unit, this is basically what it is. Now, one of the, the more fun parts of my job is to take these and convert it from coal to natural gas. So, you know, everybody, we're, we're trying to be more and more environmentally conscious. And most of our products are driven by emissions. So we, these are fun because you get to take the, a big pollution source and reduce it. So this is a tangentially fired boiler. So this big field erect like this, let me go back to go back. This one, <coughs> so this is a, a box, vertical box. And inside of it, this is kind of what it looks like looking from the top down. So on each one of the corners, you're injecting fuel and it makes this giant swirling. It looks like a fire tornado from the side. It's really neat. But these were designed this way because when you're burning coal, you want to have complete combustion. And when you throw anything into a fire tornado, it's going to burn. So, um, so this one's probably 
less than half load because when it would be full, you'd see this just big swirl. It's so a typical package boiler. What are the things we need for combustion? Air fuel source of heat. Air fuel source of heat. Air burner source of heat and fuel connects to that. So this, this basic model is the same for a package boiler or a field rack. The components are still going to be the same. And then some sort of ducting to keep it and then a stack out the back end. We talked about it a few minutes ago, but where the energy transfer happens, you have a radiant zone and you have a convective zone. So the radiant zone is where the flame is contained. Convective zone is flames out and we're still trying to get energy out of it. So this is kind of the representation of the top down of the package boiler, flame in the radiant section, then it goes through all these two banks on the convective section and then they're out to an air preheater, out to some breaching, or out to the stack. So what are some risks back here we're talking about exit temperatures. What are some of the risks if I go too low? We're engineers, we can design heat exchangers and we can get all the energy out of that. We're pretty close, right? What happens if you go too cold? Condensation, yeah. So the risk is condensation and typically it's a little bit corrosive in that environment and it will destroy the internals of these boilers or the tube banks or the ducting or whatever. So the exit temperatures, you start looking at efficiencies of boilers. We could get more out of them, but there's some limits on the material properties of what we can do. Okay, how do we calculate what energy we need? So at the beginning, what do we say boilers are for? Creating, Creating steam, right? They gotta have an output. They wanna generate steam. So we've got to look at what is the difference in enthalpy between our feed water, what's coming in, and what the steam conditions are. So we're going to try to do energy recovery methods where we have an air preheater to give us some more heat going in so we can get some more heat going out. We're going to try to preheat our feed water so we can get more total efficiency through the whole process. Um, vapor losses, because we've got to account for turning water into steam. Stack losses um, and casing losses. The casing loss is kind of surprising. Most people think, because you, if you walk up to a boiler, it's warm. I mean, it's really warm. But it's really not that much on the losses on an overall scheme. That's the math behind it at a basic level. So we're summing all of the, all of the inputs and outputs, firing rate, steam enthalpy, water enthalpy, steam flow, and the sum of all of our losses. So when we're doing a burner design, we have to take that into account, because if they say they want so much steam, we need to know the efficiency of the boiler and efficiency of the system to make sure we're putting enough heat into the boiler to get the steam output that's being required. Because okay. a lot of times, these are designed by different groups. So a boiler manufacturer is going to say, here's my boiler. Burner manufacturer, I want you to provide me a burner to put on the front of this to give me this much heat. And that's, they'll, I mean, this, this is a local boiler manufacturer. One of their cutaways, that's our equipment on the front end. So we just ship it to them, they weld it up, and off you go. I mean, to, to simplify it, a lot of these are very compartmentalized in components. So here's a boiler heat input example. This should all be in your slides. So if you are interested in going through the math, it's all there. It's a pretty good example. But like I said, you're taking what your feed water temperature in is, what your steam out is, you do the enthalpy calculations, come up with your heat input. We write programs so we don't have to do this manually. Okay, so wall-fired burners. Here's an example of the components of a wall-fired burner. They're all going to look up a little bit different because there's kind of a, 
a balancing act between boiler design and burner design. Okay, so a boiler, we want steam, and we want it in as small of a footprint as we can get it. So they want the maximum amount of heat that they can put in there. Well, the more heat we put in there, the more knocks we're going to generate. All right, so it's always a balancing act between how much space do we get in the furnace to fit the flame, what are the heat requirements, and what are the emissions. But fundamentally, this is what they look like. You've got a flame detector, and that's to make sure that you have flame when you're supposed to and you're not when you're not, so that's a safety device. Um, some sort of gas manifold, fuel injectors, a stabilizer, if you have a liquid fuel atomizer, um, the air register, which guides the air through the burner, and a refractory coral. So the refractory coral, think of it like uh, high temperature concrete. So here's an example. Um, this would be the refractory coral around the outside. Uh, primary and secondary air zones. So again, that's just for fuel and air staging, and that's to reduce the overall temperature of the flame so you can get better emissions. Because fire is pretty simple, right? I mean, you can get fire going with a, a magnifying glass and a leaf if you wanted. But controlling it and making it do something for us and meet certain emissions, that's the goal. That's the challenge. So different fuel injectors, and I brought some that I'm going to pass around um, when we get to a couple more slides up here so you can see some different examples of things. This one has a liquid fuel atomizer down the center. Uh, that can be diesel. That can be naphtha, that can be some waste liquid fuel from uh, a chemical plant or a refinery. They can be pretty much whatever. I think the, the most fuels that I've run through one burner was 11 at one time. And that was pretty interesting to do the calculations on that. So, you know, because it was all coming from different processes in a plant, you're like, well, what happened if this one goes up and this one drops out? You know, are you going to stay stable? How do you keep? So that, those are fun. Keeps the job interesting. So some average ranges, 25 to 450 million per burner. So that's a pretty large heat input. So when you start thinking of power plants, um, the biggest plant that I've done was doing um, 7,500 million BTUs per hour of fuel. But it, like I said, it was a very, very large power plant. Burner diameters, 10 to 70 inches. Uh, the biggest one I think we've done was about 14 feet across for a specialized application in Canada. Um, air side pressure drop, 4 to 15 inches. Why is, why is the pressure drop through a burner important? Can you give the negative pressure Possibly. Depends on burner design, yes. Okay, the more drop I have through a burner, the bigger the fan has to be. So you gotta think of system op optimization. So bigger the fan, the more energy it consumes, all sorts of other repercussions. Um, and then gas pressure, it can vary depending on size of equipment. But very good point, so on field erect boilers, uh, most of the time those run at a slightly negative pressure inside the furnace or right at neutral. And the reason for that is not necessarily combustion, it's for the mechanical design of the boiler. Because if I have a boiler that's 10 stories tall and I'm going to positively pressurize it, that takes a lot of structural reinforcement. So they would rather run it at a slightly negative, I mean, slightly negative, like half an inch of water column or right at zero. So that way you don't have to have all the structural reinforcements on the outside. So you can, you can walk up on a field erect and you can tell if something's going on if you see it kind of doing this a little bit. And you're like, hmm, they've got a fan problem. So. And then uh, flame diameter, you know, this one's showing about 12 feet and about 50 feet in length. That's about the max. And we have some flames that are yay big by four or five feet. For ignition and stabilization, we need a source, we need some sort of bluff body, 
and or or a swirler. So here's an example. And we talked earlier what are the three things we needed? We said heat, ignition source, and air or fuel. It depends on who you talk to, they say different things, but it's all the same. So our ignition source, it can be like a gas fired pilot. It could be a direct spark ignition. Um, but the whole point is just to light it. We have fuel, we have air, we ignite it, and we start combustion. Gas igniters. So this is some gas igniters. This one will do 25 million. We've got another one that does 40 million. It really depends on the application because sometimes you need a big igniter. Because boilers don't like to be turned on and off. They want to be up, they want to run, because when you cycle them, you're thermally stressing all of the tubes. You don't just turn a boiler on. They may take eight hours to warm up to operating temperature. So they may want something that's hot standby to keep these things running rather than shut them on and off. This is some direct spark ignition and it just, just zaps. I mean, you'll see an electronic arc that, that jumps. Uh, the way they used to do this was like a spark plug with a really long wire. So this is much more reliable. Uh, but when you're doing direct spark ignition, you do have to be aware of where your fuel air zone is right because every fuel has limits of flammability. And if you're outside that or you're not sparking in the right place, you won't light it. In this particular application, this HEI is retractable because I don't want to leave it out here, I'll burn it up. So all those types of things we have to consider, again, depending on what the customer's requirements are, what the fuel source is, all of that matters. So for flame stabilization, you need some sort of bluff body. And what does a bluff body do? Okay, it creates a low pressure recirculation zone because you have to get fuel and air in the right mix to light it and to stabilize combustion. So whether it's big blocks like on this that are refractory blocks that are interrupting the air, causing circulation. This is an example of a burner wing for a, uh, a duck burner for again, for like a, a, a cogen plant that would have this type of application. And you're mixing the fuel and air. This is a same concept, but using a swirler in the center. So I have fuel and air zones, fuels coming into those nozzles, air's coming down the outside. I want them to mix so I can get a flame. And depending on the application, I may stage the flame. We'll get to a slide here in a little bit that has fuel injectors way out here because I want to get the fuel way down the furnace before it actually lights. So that way I can have a cooler flame and lower emissions. This is an example of a swirler, and I can pass it around. Um, back in the days before CFD, we actually did cold flow modeling. Have any of you actually heard of that? Or physical modeling? They would make things that were scaled down, put them in a wind tunnel. Yeah, so this is an old version. If you guys want to see a, an ancient swirler, we wouldn't use that. It'd be metal, but. Here's all the math behind it. We're not going to get into that today. But again, just the different uh, the different swirls that you get into, because different fuels are going to mix differently. So you have to pay attention to what that is to change what the swirl is going to be. Where's flame speed? Yeah. How fast does something combust? Why is that important? You don't want flashback? Or lift off. Or lift off, right? It needs to be in the right spot. So we have to look at what's the turn down on a burner? What's the operating range? Can we be stable across that entire operating range? Typically, it's not the fuel that's the limiting factor on turndown, it's the air, because fans can only turn down so much. Um, 
And you said you had already, you've already done process burners? Okay. And I guess that's the biggest difference between process burners and boiler burners is we're all forced draft. Everything we do is forced draft. We don't have any natural draft stuff because we're trying to make a really big amount of heat transfer in the smallest amount of space we can get. So we're forcing the air in there, kind of like a turbocharger on a car. You're trying to put as much air in there as you can. Did they show you this video in the other one? Okay. I like this one. I also teach combustion safety, and I, this is one of my favorite ones. So here's the flame front. Here comes the fuel, the air, and the gas mixture. He's going to go visit Burning Man. So this is where I want it. I want it just nice, stable flame front right in front of the burner. You're talking about flashback? That's not good. Because flashback, I'm going to destroy the burner. I'm going to have safety problems. And then if it gets too far out, we have lift off and the flame goes out. So gas nozzle design, I'm going to pass around some gas nozzles just so you can see. Um, these are some that look like this. I also have some that are more bullet shaped. And all of these are specifically designed for an application to get proper fuel air mixing as well as the flame to fit in the furnace. So I may have one of these on... 90% you know, of my burners, but the drilling is going to change for every one of them. Because how do we make it fit where it needs to go? So I'll start these here. So you can see in this, this case that has six fuel injection and, one, and a liquid fuel atomizer down the center. Again, it's just trying to dictate the flame shape. Uh, sometimes you have a gas ring that goes around the outside, and in this case, it's basically just a pipe with holes in it. Nothing really fancy. The other style is, in this case, this is a uh, rapid mix burner, and it's hard to see, but each one of these little lines is one of these fins. And I'll pass these around. So it kind of looks like a jet turbine, except every one of them has holes in it. So it's injecting fuel through one of these to get rapid mixing right as it comes out into the burner. So I'll pass these around. So here's an example of a bunch of these little fins that I just passed around. You can see the holes in it going all the way around the outside. This one actually has two fuel air zones, one around the outside, one around the inside. Liquid fuel atomization. So why do we atomize fuel? So you can burn it. So I can burn it. That's pretty simple. Why, why do I need to atomize it? You said so I can burn it. But what are we trying to do? Because I can have a puddle of gas on the ground and light that. It burns, right? Increase surface area. Increase surface area. That's exactly right. So a droplet with a surface area of one, or excuse me, has a volume of one cubic centimeter, has 4.83 square centimeters of surface area. I drop it into a million drops, and my surface area increase two orders of magnitude. So I can burn it much, much faster. Here's an example. This was just being water. So pressure jets. Does anybody know what a pressure jet is? So 
is mechanical atomization. A good example of this is a power washer. Right? I put a lot of pressure behind it and I split the water into little droplets. Okay. But there are limits. You can only, in a pressure washer, you want as much as you want. It's a constant flow. On a burner, I want to be able to turn it down so I can do it. So these have very limited use unless you just have something that's going to run at the same rate all day long. Um, different swirls, again, to affect the pattern that's coming out of it. The more common way is to mix steam and your liquid fuel. So I'm going to take the steam to use that energy to break it into little droplets. And now I can vary what my firing rate is. And there's, there's a couple different ways to do this. You'll, you'll see on some of the next slides. Um, sometimes it basically mixes it in the cap. Another way is a wide jet which basically shears the oil because the oil is coming in at the very end of the tip and the steam comes back, it, back and shears the oil stream and you get really good atomization. I'm going to pass some of those around now so you can see what those look like. These all do the same thing. They're just different sizes. They have different hole patterns for different applications. All of that's going to vary by what the fuel is, sometimes what the temperature is. Because what hap you know, what, why is temperature important? For liquids. What changes? Viscosity. Viscosity, density, all sorts of things. That matters. Just different examples. This looks similar to what's being passed around. This shows what a, a diesel flame looks like when it's steam atomized. They're pretty, typically pretty bright orange. Very luminous. There's also a big difference in what you're burning and where you can actually pick up the energy. So an oil flame or coal flame has a lot of radiant energy that it generates. A natural gas flame, you're going to pick up most of the energy in the convective section. So when you're going to convert one of these big field erected power boilers, you have to look at where is the energy transfer occurring? Can we get the same performance out of it? Do we, can the tubes handle it? Because we're changing where the heat source is, where they designed for it. You know, how is this really going to affect it? So you can't just go, yeah, we'll convert it over and see what happens. So that's why I like those projects. Flame detection. Why is flame detection important? You need to know if you're lit or not. You need to know if you're lit or not. Okay. What else? Let's say I want to go light my burner. Should I see flame inside the boiler? If I'm going to light it, I shouldn't see flame. If I see flame, something's wrong. Right? So maybe I had a liquid fuel atomizer and are spraying into a boiler and the operator didn't purge it correctly. He sprayed oil into the bottom of the furnace. It was above the auto ignition temperature and I have a flame in there. I don't want to add more fuel, right? So those are important safeguards to make sure that you see flame when you're supposed to and you don't see flame when you're not. So we're, you know, in the, in the video with Burning Man, you know, when the flame lifted off, we want to shut the fuel off because we don't want to be continuing sending fuel into a hot furnace. Because if it finds an ignition source, it's not good. Different ways to do it, um, UV, IR, flame rods, it really depends on what the fuel source is because they all produce different light. So this is a, a frequency spectrum of what a scanner might see. And this one is showing from 0 to 250 hertz. So we'll actually measure where it is and say you need to tune it. On that big wall-fired unit that was there, there are lots of burners in there. How, do I, how can I make sure that I can see the burner I'm actually looking at? So they will actually tune the scanners for the specific burner that's right in front of it. Because if I'm trying to light a burner and it's seeing a cross and seeing another flame, it won't let me light it because it thinks that, that there's a fire in there and, hey, don't light it. So. They're very, very important safeguards. Okay. 
So now, how does this apply to boiler burners? So we talked about this a little bit already about the tip drillings. We want to make sure that the flame will fit in the furnace that we have. Why is that important? You don't want the flames hit the walls. You don't want the flames hit the walls. Or if I have a really big furnace, I want a bigger flame so I can increase the heat transfer, or maybe I can make my flame shorter. So a lot of time is spent on what is the tip of this going to be and how does it disperse into the furnace? Because if you just look at mass flow, you know how much fuel you need, that's pretty simple. Here's my flow rate. So this part is the complicated part. So we use it to shape flame and then also control knocks because that's basically controlling the temperature of your flame. So here's, these are all oil flames all the same heat release, but different flame shape. So this highest NOx, why is this the highest NOx? Any guesses? Very concentrated flame, very high temperature. Perfect, that's right. Compact flame, real high heat. Lower NOx, it's got more volume. Lowest NOx, what's wrong with this picture? Any guesses? hitting the walls. My flame is hitting the wall of this furnace. So what happens when I hit the walls? Another, I mean, I'll end up with sooting, but then typically if you're doing that, you're quenching a flame and you're going to start generating CO. And typically the things that are regulated are what's your carbon monoxide and what are your NOx. Or carbon monoxide, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. CO and NOx. And liquid fuel, you're going to mess with socks because they typically have sulfur in them. So these are different locations of fuel injectors. So these are right around the middle. This would be a nice, tight, compact flame. This one's going to be a bigger flame. Two different air zones. This one has two different air zones, but this, this one, the furnace was very tall and skinny. Um, this one, we had a very large furnace. So these outer fuel injectors, I'm going to have a flame right in the middle, but then these outer fuel injectors are pushing gas way down the furnace. So this makes my flame much longer, but it's cooler. And then I get better emissions. So it's all about staging fuel and air to lower the overall adiabatic flame temperature. So again, this is a nice tight one, um, similar to oil, or if we had an oil injector in the middle, we may use something like this to stabilize a much bigger frame, bigger flame. These are spread out a little bit more. Again, more diffuse flame, lower NOx. We can still get a pretty good compact flame out of this. So here's an example. Natural gas flames are typically more translucent. The oil flames are the bright yellow, orange. You can't always judge a fuel by its color. Some people say, oh, what's, what's a good boiler performance look like? Well, it depends. What's the fuel? What am I burning? What's the air? I mean, so some people say, what's a good flame look like? Well, this one I like. This one's good. Again, this was the stage that we were talking about, primary in the middle, stage around the outside. Here's an example of this. So we talked a little bit about this earlier, about what, what do we want out of steam? We want the most steam out of the smallest thing that I can get because metal tubes cost a lot of money, so I want it nice and short. So we have to look at what is the space heat release and what can I do with the burner. 
So as the space heat release goes up, flame fit becomes more challenging because that means they want more energy per volume. So the longer I can get my boiler, the lower my space heat release can be, the lower my adiabatic flame temperature, the less emissions I can get. So who said hitting the walls earlier? Yeah, so this is an example of flames hitting the walls. There is impingement. High NOx has a flame fit issue. Maybe high carbon monoxide. So there's a kind of a trade-off on temperature. The lower you go, the higher your CO goes. The higher you go, the lower the CO and the higher the NOx. So it's a balancing act. This one is for a very large furnace. This, you remember the big OTSG we saw in the beginning? This is the inside of it. So I think this thing is 16 feet across. Huge furnace. Get really great emissions out of this. But the flame is really long. But they don't care because they're just going to use them and dump the steam in the ground. And so they build them this way because they're actually better for the water treatment or lack thereof. Here's again more examples of staged combustion. Longer flames. That's it. That's boiler burners in a nutshell. Told you I'd get through them quickly. What do you think? What, what questions do you have? Do you test them like at your test facility? Yes, we do. Uh, there's a limit um, because I can't test utility scale burners in my facility, but I can scale them down and test them. We do that regularly. Um, sometimes it's for customer tests, sometimes it's research and development. Sometimes it's maybe a new fuel. Uh, lots of reasons to test things, but yeah, we do. Was I that boring? What other questions? Which uh, location has the toughest regulation for non in the world? Oh, I would say California. That's, I mean, California, California, you're limited on what technology you can use <coughs> because of the NOx emissions. You're either going to take um, a burner that has very, very low emissions, or you're gonna do a lot of back-end cleanup like with a selective catalytic production, SCR or um, SNCR, either way. But you ship something to, let's say, China, they typically don't have a lot of regulations. They're getting better. They're, they're seeing more and more regulations is out of there. I mean, if you see some of the pictures there's lots of smog and they're doing a better job. I mean, but at one point, California was like that. You know, and then they did their clean air and they've gotten much better. So uh, we actually had an app, th that reminds me, Chuck, thank you. We had, a, we had an application in California. We couldn't meet emissions. We're like, something is not right. I mean, this burner always is lower than this. Something's not right. Uh, we're watching it, we're watching it. Finally, one of the service technicians unplugs his analyzer and plugs it into the combustion air side of the fan. We were actually reading more NOx going into the fan than what was going out of the stack. So we made the air cleaner coming out than it was going in. We're like, we can't fix that. That's an air problem. We're doing our part. And they're like, oh, yeah, okay, you can go home now. So that was a pretty neat example. But what else? Yeah. The more commonly used package burners or like fuel directed burners? Most of the time, it's more common to do package boilers. You, there are not a lot of field erected projects anymore. Most of the field erected boilers have been there for a while. Um, but you, again, everything's emissions based. So you 
see, you, you don't really have new coal plants going in. If you're going to have a new power station, typically they're natural gas. You're going to have a gas turbine. You're going to have um, a heat recovery steam generator on the back end of it where you're generating steam, and then you run it through a secondary turbine. So you don't see a lot of these big field erects anymore. Not in the U.S. I mean, there are some. Uh, we see a lot of conversions where people want to take a coal plant and convert it to natural gas. But some of it is economics, okay? Um, I have a, I'm an owner, I have a coal plant, it's 40 years old. I have completely depreciated that asset. It no longer has any value to me. Now you have to look at what is the cost of retrofitting that piece of equipment, investing more money in a 40 year old asset, or do I decommission it and build a new gas plant? So and that, that really depends on the fuel prices. It also depends on who's the president. Right? Because everything we do is emissions based. There are a lot of rules that were going to go in place under the Obama administration for EPA changes. Trump rolled them back. So now you look at end users, whether it's a package boiler, field erect, now they're going to say, well, why do I need to upgrade anymore? That was going to be expensive. And I don't have to. So it, it can depend on who's the policymaker in charge. What else? Anything? Either I did a really good job or a really bad job. <laughs> so. Anything else, Chuck? You want? Okay. Well, thank you, everyone.